Welcome to Flashpoint, the Fire Inside podcast, featuring leadership and team building principles designed to ignite your inner fire. Now, your host, international speaker, and best selling author, Frank Viscuso. So, I'm here with Frank Ritchie. Frank, first of all, let me ask you a question Is it Richie? Very simple, Richie. All right. See now, because listen, you know, I, I'm talking to a man with a legitimate Italian pizza oven behind him. I'm thinking I got your name right, but you got friends out in the New Haven area that somehow don't pronounce your name correctly. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I know who I am. So whether it's guys and girls in New Haven or the national media, I just kind of let it go. It's you know, it's not worth correcting. I, I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, I appreciate you, man. You're a good friend. I appreciate you taking time to come on to Flashpoint. Talk to us a little bit about command presence. Uh, I have a lot of stuff that I want to cover with you. Um, and But before I even get there, I want to let you know that I have um, a lot of respect for everything that you've accomplished. I'm bringing up some notes right now. I, and I, it's funny. I look at your, your bio, and I'm like, I don't even know if I want to read this bio because it's uh, – well, it's quite impressive. It's long. It's long. I mean, you know, a, a lead plaintiff in a landmark Supreme Court case testified before Congress. You've been on so many, uh, you know, uh, Hannity, Lou Dobbs, Harbaugh, uh, NBC Nightly News, you name it. Uh, the work you do with fire engineering. Put all that stuff aside, by the way. You're just a, 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 a firmly committed firefighter who, since I've known you, has had something that I would classify as command presence, which is what we're here to talk about. But what I would like to do is first just ask you to talk to our listeners and just tell them a little bit about your journey, like what led you into the fire service? Well, when I was a kid, we had a choice. We could either be firemen, firemen, or firemen. So I <laughs> decided to be a fireman. Uh, both of my brothers uh, were on the job and it was kind of like follow what your brothers do. And my father, ironically, uh, took the test after Vietnam, and there was a CEDAR program to hire veterans. And he scored number one without the CEDAR program. And because of politics, he wasn't hired. So it was a little bit of serendipity because he went into media. And his guidance has helped me tremendously throughout my life. But so I became a firefighter, you know, at, at 14, like everybody else, you know, what's better you know look at all of the services in government someone calls 911 and the fire department just shows up within four to five minutes with four people willing to help with no paperwork you know the fire service is the best municipal and government service and you know the rest of the government can learn a lot from that fire service model yeah very well put very well put and so uh, you, uh, you know, worked with, uh, were you with New Haven your entire career? Oh, no. Uh, what do you call it? I, uh, I, I followed in my brother's footsteps and I moved in as soon as I graduated high school, being a, a volunteer, you know, started off as an explorer. Um, I think I was like the youngest EMT in Connecticut at like 14 or 15 years old at the time. I moved into a firehouse in Montgomery County, Maryland. And that's really where um, okay. the, the passion has kind of really took off because living in a firehouse um, in Rockville was just one of the greatest experiences. And one, when we talk about leadership, what's real interesting, Frank, is that a lot of times when we look back on a career, we view leadership almost linear. So you work for one officer, then you work for another officer, you get promoted. But when you live in a firehouse as a young firefighter, you get to see four shifts all within the same week with all four different bosses or five different bosses. And you really get to see what works, what doesn't work. And you get to kind of see it in real time instead of that ladder. And I think that it was that experience that made me the officer that I became and the firefighter that I became. So living in a career firehouse in Rockville Volunteer Fire Department was one of the best experiences of my life. That is such a great thing that you just said, because I've often said this, I know you agree with this. Three or four different groups is often like four different fire departments. They run differently. Um, it depends on the officer in charge, depends on the people, depends on what's accepted. I have uh, often compared, uh, you know, in Flashpoint, uh, the 
the four stages of team development, incipient growth, fully developed, and decay, right? And I'm trying to explain to people that you could be randomly, I'm just going to say group A, station B, or station two, I'm sorry, group A, station two, you could be a fully developed station, but group A, station one could be in the decay stage. Like you can have in one shift, all aspects of good and bad leadership. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. And then, uh, you know, just so I don't leave them out, while I was living in the firehouse, I got hired working for Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad inside the Beltway. And then from there, I got a job in a small town in Connecticut, Middletown, worked there for eight months. And here's the thing. What that gave me working in Middletown was they would show up to a fire with like seven firefighters. So I have an appreciation for the small town fire department. And then I did 22 years in New Haven. Mm, yeah. And New Haven. Now I have to shout out to New Haven because we, everybody wants to think uh, what they have is the best. I live in, in New Jersey. Now I'm in South Jersey, but I lived in North Jersey, Kearney um, for you know the majority of my life. And always thought pizza in New Jersey, Northern New Jersey is the best in the world. And then I got, connected through you and some other friends uh jim duffy pizza in new haven connecticut and i can tell you i tell everybody new haven connecticut pizza is pretty awesome it's pretty Our school awesome sports even puts us as number one pizza in the world but dave hasn't been over to my house yet because i make a pretty mean pizza yeah i wouldn't know because i haven't been there yet because i don't think i've ever got the invite i'm kidding oh no you've that. been invited but you've been too bit you know Frank, best-selling author, a little bit too busy to stop by Richie's house to have a beer and a pizza. So you've been well. Now that I know that you make pizza, I thought I was just going to have to sit there, drink bourbon, and hear you tell war stories. But now I know I can have a good slice of pizza. The whole dynamic of everything just changed. My next pizza. time through, I'm actually coming up. Uh, well, I mean, I'm coming up uh, at the end of this year, but I know in March, I'm going up, passing through, but I'm going up to um, a couple places. Uh, to speak, but I'm going to actually, for the first time ever, be going to Nantucket to speak. Oh, perfect. For me, trying to figure out how to get to Nantucket has been more difficult than any other place. You know, do I take the ferry? Do I take the train? Do I take the walk on ferry? But we'll figure it all out. But when, when, I, when I do that trip, I think that'll be when I definitely have time to sit in your backyard and and chat. Yeah, stop but, by. Always welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about well, you know, before we even get into command presence, see, you're you are a guy. I, it's a perfect title for your book, by the way, um, because you are a guy that, to me, has always uh, held yourself with with um, a tremendous amount of posture. Like when I'm in the presence of of you, uh, I'm like, here's a guy that he's in control of the moment. That's how you portray it, and I don't know that if that's how you always feel, but I feel like you're in control of the moment. And I'm I'm thinking, so, you know, if I'm in a foxhole, that's the kind, this is the kind of guy, Frank Ritchie's the kind of guy I want right next to me in a foxhole. Uh, that's how I look at you. And I don't know if I've ever told you that. But talk about when you were, I guess, a bit younger and you had to do things like testify and, and uh, you were put on a big stage. How did you develop the posture and the command presence to be able to handle big moments? Well, I think command presence comes down to being competent. So you have to know your craft. You have to be able to pull a certain amount of confidence. And that comes from knowing your craft. You know, you have to be willing to step out front. And here's the thing. You have to be willing to make yourself uncomfortable and be calm and try to still find a way that, you know, no matter where you work, I was just talking to somebody who just made assistant chief in a small town. I said, no matter where you work, and he was kind of a little stressed out about this or that, I said, you got to have a little bit of fun every day. You got to be able to view it that this is fun, even while you're being uncomfortable. And you got to get used to being challenged. Um, so much of our political debate, the firehouse debate, even the kitchen table, you know, nobody wants to talk to each other. Cogent debate is what really gets you to that next level to be comfortable and have that confidence to have fun in those high stakes situations. Um, you know, and I'm somebody who, as Andrew Jackson said, I was born in the storm and the calm has never suited me. So 
just that's where you grow when you're willing to make yourself a little bit uncomfortable, but you got to do your homework. You got to put in the work. And that's where your command presence comes in. You know, like I often say, if you want to be the officer, you want to be the chief officer that walks into a firehouse and has dinner and never has to wash their own plate. Well, then you have to have been the firefighter who never let an officer wash their plate. You know, it starts from when you first start off. Uh, my, my neighbor's a, a Green Beret. I shovel his driveway. He drinks my beer. I get the butter, better end of that, that deal. And he always says, if you don't know who the ass is in the first week, it's probably you. And he tries to compare being a Green Beret with the fire department. I reject that premise of that. But what he says is that even as a Green Beret, you're only doing really cool things, you know, 10% of the time. That kind of fits with the fire service a little bit. But how you judge your other Green Berets is what they're doing the other 90% of the time. Are they cleaning their weapons? Are they working with the indigenous yes. um, population? Are they putting together quality training programs? Because that's what the Green Berets do. They train the indigenous population. So, you know, you got to realize you're not just judged by going to a fire alone. You're judged by how you carry yourself all the time. And a lot of it starts with in the firehouse is housework. You know, individuals don't want to do housework anymore. That's the first way you get noticed in the firehouse. Do a little 10, 15 minute extra. Don't let the officer do the dish. And then when you become an officer, nobody will be saying, oh, look, that's what you did. There's a story right. in the book, Command Presence, that I, that I think would resonate with you, is that I was in New York City for a uh, memorial service. And on the sink, Frank, in Sharpie marker is the name of two firefighters. And I go, what's that? And they said, well, when you get assigned to 27 truck, if you're the probie, you sign your name on the sink with a Sharpie and you own the sink until the next probie goes in. And then I'm standing there with Jay Jonas, who I'm, I don't want to miss rank him. I think he was a deputy chief at that time. He goes, the only thing I regret in my career. Now, this is a guy who, you know, became famous from 9-11, but has respect of his command officers and peers. He goes, the one thing I regret in my career is not having a picture when my name was on that sink. So yeah. I think that we got to own every single thing we do from being a firefighter on up. Man, I love everything you just said. I love everything. Starting with staying calm and being willing to be challenged. You don't grow in your comfort zone. And I think if you're not uncomfortable in your role as a leader, you're not going to reach your potential as a leader because it's all about becoming uncomfortable. The one thing you said about your 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 buddy, the Green Beret, and I have a buddy who's a Green Beret too, um, by the way, who um, who said something similar, um, talking about how our professions are a little similar. And like you, I kind of rejected that. But then I heard someone in uh, Special Forces explain it this way, the, the similarities between Special Forces and firefighting. And here's what he said. We both fight an enemy that could strike any time during the day and night. We both fight an enemy that hits us with an unknown size and intensity, and we both fight an enemy that maneuvers rapidly, causing us to have to adapt and rely on teamwork in order to defeat. And I said, now that I can get behind. Their enemy may be, you know, a, a group of, of people with, with uh, you know, guns, ours is a fire or whatever it may be. But then he went on to say, uh, but here's why people in special forces are successful. One is their selection process. That's where we're a little bit different. Sometimes I know now I think we're being more selective, maybe maybe not everywhere, but um, it seems to be a little bit more selective um, when they're bringing people on. But one is their selection process. So we know it's harder to become a Navy SEAL than a firefighter. We know that. But two um, is the tools and equipment they have. We have the tools and equipment that they have to do our job the same way they have to do their job. But three, and this is what you were just kind of referring to, is, is the training, preparation. And I firmly 100% agree with what you just said. It starts with the simple things. The discipline starts with simple things. And when people come out with this whole, and I spoke at a, at a, at a department one time where they were, they, where they were having an issue with a firefighter that didn't know their job. But and the and the firefighters were complaining that the administration only cared about what uniform you were wearing, 
not whether or not this individual could or could not do their job. And, and so as I'm talking to them, I come to find out that three individuals in that room I was teaching, officers, all officers, three individuals were violating the uniform policy. And none of these people had worked one-on-one -on -one with the firefighter they say they're having a problem with. So you're, I, I don't want to, and I tell them this, I said, the last thing I want to do is, is put the focus on a uniform, who's wearing a uniform, who's not, just wear the uniform, make it that simple, just wear the uniform, but don't complain about the person that doesn't know their job if you're not putting time into developing that person. If you're focusing all your time on, they don't care about this, we find ourselves, I think, in fire departments where people complain about the culture, but they're creating the culture that they're complaining about. It's almost like pigs don't, pigs roll around in the mud smelling like a pig. Why? Because pigs don't know pigs think that's their environment. We create this environment. We complain about the environment when we have the power to change it too. Can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on that? Well, the okay. uniform issue seems to be a crush, a crutch for incompetence because you get a new chief they're uncomfortable in their position. And instead of trying to figure out what their blind spots are and focusing on what a chief needs to focus on, they focus on a petty issue yes. and they expose and diminish their own command. And then, you know, you said it perfectly. You said, here's these officers that are complaining about uniforms and they're out of uniform because there's something about the policy that, hey, I'm the chief. I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, even if they look good, they're essentially like a crystal vase that doesn't hold water. Um, they're diminishing their own command every time they talk about a, a uniform issue. If, if they're not upholding that standard, how can you expect somebody else to do it? You know, I've never been big on the uniform. You know, people are surprised because I usually wear a jacket all, everywhere I go. But to me, the only thing I cared about my firefighters was that they were ready to work. You know, they had a T-shirt on that didn't have holes in it. They wore their gear properly and they treated people with respect. Mm. That's what, what people, people remember. You know, the firefighter is a worker. The chief that tends to overly focus on the uniform tends to diminish their own command, especially when they're not even following it. So the, the uniform thing just tends to play out time and time again across the country. Oh, and it's actually yeah. disappointing. There's a, there's a proper time and explain why. So here's an example. My shift consistent set of standards, your work, and I expect you, you know, checking out your equipment, doing doing your housework, you know, I, I don't care, you're in a t-shirt, that's fine. But if we go to do a school where like a public interaction, I expect you to wear your uniform. Yep. Um, one thing with the officers that's pretty interesting is I always used to wear a t-shirt too. And one time the assistant chief uh, sat me down and he said, and instead of giving me a lecture, he explained the why, which I think is important in leadership, explain the thought process. And he said, he said, you know, your, your crew's tight. We never have any complaints about your crew, but you know, we'd like you to wear you to be at least wearing your uniform shirt when you go on calls, if you're not wearing your coat. And he said, the reason for it is it's how the public views you and it'll give you more command presence on the ship. So I was like, but I'm working. And he's like, yeah, but what do you call it? You're going to see that there's going to be a difference in how the public interacts with you. So I said, well, chief, I'll give it a try. And so I started wearing my white shirt. I would just hang it on the, the hook of the, the piece and put it in. And I worked in a very socioeconomically deprived area, an Ecuadorian uh, neighborhood in New Haven. And I really found absolutely no difference on how the community viewed me or interacted with me. because the community, even when there's a language barrier, they can always tell if you respect them and if you're there to help them and you go out of your way to make that difference. So I was like, okay, this is a failed experience. But then it turned out the chief was right. Where I found that the inter interaction improved was my interaction with the police department. So we ran with the cops all the time and it was palpable by wearing a white uniform shirt, you get dirty all the time. It didn't change the interaction with the community but it changed how I was able to interact with the police. They took me more serious. And I was like, wow, that's a pretty eye-opening thing. And then I became a believer that the boss should have, should have a white shirt. And uh, so you can always learn something new. It's, and it's great that you, uh, that you are experiencing that and picking up this and, and being aware of how people are 
treating you differently. And again, back to the uniform, and we, I, I agree with you, everything you said about that. For me, it was real simple. I like to explain to my members, look, we, get, we have certain policies. These are our policies. Just follow them. Just follow them. They're our policies. So we don't have to go back and say, your mustache is too long. You're wearing the wrong uniform. I don't want to deal with that stuff. Just follow them. Uh, I recently had someone on the podcast that said their chief went around to everybody and and a brand new chief came in and said one on one conversations and said, what can I do in your eyes to make this department better? And took a tremendous amount of uh, information gathered from everybody and then sat down with them and said, OK, I'm going to work to try to make these things happen and make it better. Here's some things I want from you in return. Let's look out for each other. Let's, you know, and, and try to create that. Hey, I got your back. I need you to have mine back. And there was some value that because he said, hey, right there, we knew we had a good chief because he was listening to us. He was asking us questions and listening. And he wasn't just saying, wear this, do that, do it that way and not paying attention to what we had to say. He le legitimately wanted to hear what our views were. And at the same time, um, he was also the type of guy that said, look, I I'm not asking everybody to agree with me. I'm just asking if you understand me, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. Now let's just go do it. So there was that level of, of uh, command too. Uh, Frank, I want to cover a couple a, of things. Oh, your thoughts on that. Yeah. There's a trap in that. Okay. So that is a great leadership, leadership tactic only if it's done correct. So here's the trap. I've seen a lot of chiefs and a lot of people in leadership positions in the industry and the fire service where they get into that position of power and they're going to immediately meet with all of the lower subordinates to kind of get a pulse of what's going on. That's a mistake. If you don't meet with your command officers or your vice presidents first, mm -hmm. because if you don't meet with your leadership first and communicate your vision and get their input first, before you go on the floor, before you talk to every firefighter, what tends to happen is the chief goes around and that chief's got to be on message because you got to be careful to say the same thing to each person, because if not, you start creating rumors that just grow. So you got to stay on message when you go have these visits to interact, to get the pulse. But what happens is you talk to these firefighters, then all of a sudden the firefighters go to the chief or the battalion chief and say, chief so-and-so said this. Now your command officers are learning about your vision right. through their ordinance and you're diminishing your battalion chiefs and your base in a sense. You know, there's a reason in politics. We always want to expand our base. We always want to reach out. But that's why they say you always got to touch base. You always got to talk to your base. So I agree with your tactic, but just meet with your command officers first. Make sure that you kind of, that will help cover a blind spot for you. It'll kind of get you the feel of what their perspective is. It'll get you to say, okay, this is going to be my message in each firehouse. And then when you meet with the individuals, you're going to be getting that input, but they're not going to be running back and undermining the command of your officers that support you, that you're going to need the support of. That's fantastic advice. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. Um, let me give you a scenario and see how you would suggest this be handled. And that's one that I hear quite often. And it's something, uh, as an example, say you are a, a battalion chief and your rank structure is you have firefighter, lieutenant, captain, battalion. You're a battalion chief and a firefighter who's been offered 10 years and is a good firefighter has a significant issue with a brand new lieutenant and maybe even the captain. In other words, the issue is uh, the new lieutenant comes in, wants to change everything. They're butting heads. And this firefighter wants to, wants to uh, basically address this issue, but can't talk to that individual. Would you suggest that that person jumps rank and says, I can't talk to the lieutenant. Let me talk to the captain or the battalion about this situation. How, what advice would you give to a firefighter in that type of situation I just described? Okay, there's, there's a rule I like to put forward. I call it the Patton rule. So General Patton was one of the greatest generals of all time. And yet many fail to realize how he diminished his command and basically ruined his entire career and got a stern rebuke for his actions when he was walking through a camp 
And instead of having non subsidive conversations, which is always good for the chiefs to have non subsidive uh, conversations with their subordinates, he went up to somebody in a medical tent who was suffering from, at the time, they would call it like battle shock, battle shock, right? shock. And he called him a coward and smacked him. Mm-hmm. And that essentially ruined his career. So what I took out of that is here's the rule. If you're a chief of, and I'll, I'll do it in reverse too. If you're the chief officer, okay, you always want to, you can go two ranks down, one rank up. It's the same for a firefighter. So it's two. So in other words, you're the battalion chief. The only people you should be having a subsidive conversation with, I'm not talking about niceties, how's your family, your kid playing baseball, I'm talking about a subsidive operational or administrative conversation should be two ranks down, your lieutenant and your captain. Okay. So you're only talking to the lieutenant captain. The lieutenant should only be talking to the captain. And if they have to CC one rank up, which would be the battalion chief, we see people become a lieutenant and they're CCing every command officer in the department, right? Mm-hmm. They want everybody to hear their concerns. It doesn't allow there to even be a chain of command. So for that firefighter who has the concern, first, maybe this is a mentoring thing, especially if this firefighter happens to be right and is a good firefighter. So this is where the captain, hopefully they're in the same house, should be able to recognize that this is happening before it even comes to them. I mean, something something's going on here that should be recognized. The firefighter has no issue going to the lieutenant or one rank above. He shouldn't go to the battalion chief, shouldn't go to the chief of department. Um, the captain can go two ranks down, can go to the lieutenant and the firefighter. So the captain can help mentor and bring these two people along. It mm-hmm. seems that, you know, I don't have all the information, but it seems that the new lieutenant might just be trying to rush down that hill instead of evaluating what's going on. And I say to any officer, you go to a new place. I hate that thing where they say, as the boss, you sit down and you tell them your expectations and everybody's going to follow them. Yet maybe in a, a, a like this pristine fire department, but you do that in any city, they're going to eat you alive. I found the better way is if you're that new officer is evaluate things over six months and communicate your expectations and visions through training and then start intersecting, start interjecting change. Don't just come in there and say, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to be the new sheriff. You're almost setting yourself up for failure. It shows that you don't trust your personnel. And the chances are, if you're new, you're this new lieutenant that want to change everything. You probably don't understand the ground truth completely. You might be getting a little bit over your skis. And this might be where the captain can calm him down a little, but also the captain could probably build that senior firefighter, that 10 year firefighter to actually help the Lieutenant, you know, that firefighter needs to know that they're valued and realize that they don't have to take that Lieutenant head on. They could also do it by volunteering to do training by working. I mean, the senior firefighter is your first follower and you got to build your first follower as a Lieutenant. So the fact that they're taking on the senior man right off the bat or senior woman without mentoring them and without getting on trying to get on the same page um that's a problem you know this might even be a thing where the captain gets the lieutenant and the firefighter together for a beer outside of work you know try to find some commonality you know if they both care about what what motivates them you know do they both care about the job don't there's a lot of different interpersonal figures but i think the firefighter jump into the battalion chief is a recipe for disaster you know, and and I think uh, the very last part of what you just said, get together for a beer, we can resolve so much conflict with a conversation. And what you realize, I find in my life, the con- every time I have something that looks like it's going to become, uh, you know, a, basically a hostile situation, I have conflict with another human being or a group of people, I have a conversation with them and you realize, oh, wait, this was more of a misunderstanding than anything else, or at least we took care of the problem before it became a real problem. It's like putting water on a small fire. You can put the fire out before it becomes a large one. I'm talking with Frank Ritchie, command presence, increase your influence. And, uh, you know, Frank, what, one of the things uh, that I wanted to talk to you about was uh, I'm at FDIC one time. Uh, we're having a conversation and um, don't remember what led to this. I just remember you saying to me, you should mail your wife, wife, or you should uh, send your wife some flowers. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. 
you know, I'm pretty, I was working full time, traveling a lot, doing a lot of teaching. I'm at that point right now, not now, now I'm in a great place, a great place. But back then I was at that point when I talked to you at that moment where I'm like, man, I'm, I'm spending too much time away from home and I don't like it. And I, I, I like being here at FDIC, but I kind of wish my wife would, and I'm talking to you about this stuff and you're like, you should send her some flowers. I said, man, that's such great advice. So I actually sent my wife some flowers and uh, unexpected. So it was well-received. It's not mother's day. It's not her birthday. It's not a special holiday. And I always thought that was such great advice. And then uh, last FDIC, a buddy of mine, I'm sitting down talking with him and, I don't want to say his name, but he's saying he was having some challenges uh, with his marriage. I wasn't having challenges with my marriage at the time. I was just feeling like I want to be home. Uh, but he was having some challenges with his. And I said, you ought to send your wife some flowers. So he sent his wife some flowers. And he says, man, my wife was crying. She just got him. Thank you so much for that advice. I said, thank Frank Ritchie. Thank and then he saw you. And three of us had a conversation about this. I'm bringing that up for a reason, because uh, when we talk about command presence, I mean, I don't want this to just be something limited to the fire ground. I want people to understand that that command presence happens in your household, with your marriage. It happens when you're a parent, with your kids. It happens when you're a coach. I have people in my backyard right now, and as you know, Frank knows this. Some of you may hear this. Maybe you can't. I have a jackhammer going off in my backyard right now, but I have one guy leading a team of three others right now. Command presence happens everywhere. But back to that story about the flowers and um, and what I'm talking about, leading in your house and leading in, in maybe a more softer environment. You want to talk about your just thoughts on that? Well, well, this is that was a Tom Edison moment. I was borrowing brilliance. So how this came about was Chris Pepler and I were in Steve Hamilton's class and Chris Pepler was sending his wife flowers. And I said, Chris, that's a great idea. Here's my credit card. And. Chris sent my wife flowers and said it was from Chris, love Chris Pepler. So my wife got flowers at home and said, and the card was written out from Chris Pepler. So she called me up and she said, why is Chris Pepler sending me flowers? Oh, that's yeah. hysterical. See, I didn't know that part of the story. Yeah. So then I started doing it um, religiously a after that. It was a good, <laughs> but uh, you know, you gotta, you, again, you always got to touch base, right? You always got to, who's who's the first follower who's the person that's gonna make or break you you know if you're the officer it's the driver if you're the president of a company it's the vice president or the cfo uh, you know you gotta build the people that are gonna build you and carry your message and carry your vision forward and you got to find you know we talked about that firefighter and lieutenant you got to find the shared purpose of you know they may be completely different but what's their shared purpose that you can build on to get those two individuals together. I, I like that. You know, I want to um, I want to talk about something I just mentioned a minute ago that I have a, uh, uh, some guys working in my backyard. I want to explain this because because I I was just having this conversation with my wife yesterday. Um, we open up our pool, we turn on our uh, you know uh, just turn on the filter, have everything running. About six hours later, I have water bubbling out from underneath my liner, like pushing it out. And it turns out that I had a, a leak in a pipe by the stairs. So now I have to lift the stairs up and we had to get a new liner anyway. So now it's the perfect time. We pull the liner out. And as this whole process is happening, when you pull the liner out, I thought it was mold. It's actually green algae everywhere underneath the liner. And my wife is like, that's gross. It's, you know, it's bumpy. It's everywhere. I said, yeah, we're going to spray some stuff on it. We're going to kill that all. But I explained to her, I said, you know, Laura, I said, um, it reminds me of the movie Blue Velvet. There's an opening scene where it's just, you know, kids are playing, a man's mowing his lawn, a beautiful town, the fire department drives by, they're waving. And uh, all of a sudden, the guy that's mowing the lawn falls down, has a heart attack. And when he falls down, the camera goes from him to underneath the ground. And underneath the ground, there's all these critters. And it shows this, this like disgusting or evil uh, element that that exists under this facade. And I'm explaining this to my wife. Like, we're going to have this new liner on and it's going to look beautiful. But nobody understands what's underneath these pools. 
And I said, and that's how it is sometimes with people. Sometimes there's people that look the part. They play the part. Yeah, look, like I know certain people that are, that are chief officers, not certain people, but one, you know, people that are in leadership positions in general that uh, come across like they are, like they do have command presence, but it's just the facade because they have their ulterior motive. They have uh, an underlying part of them that they're really playing for something else. Is there a way that you, besides maybe spending time with people and seeing if their words match their actions, is there a way that you can tell if somebody's legitimate or somebody's just playing the role? Earlier, you talked a little bit about this saying they need to know their job. You need to know your job. That's what I love about you. You seem to be one of the most educated firefighters I've ever known. But but on that topic, I'm just talking about, is there something that you say, hey, this is a red flag? And then I want to talk about how we diminish our own command based on an article you wrote. Okay, so spotting that false command presence, somebody who just has confidence, but yet they're not calm. You know, that's a that's a, a perfect thing. Somebody who has, you know, is up there on Facebook and Twitter, and yet when they go to emergency, they're running around like chicken little. So, I mean, that's that's the easy one. Um, probably the the one that you really got to pay attention to, and you know, if you really look, you can see the board is the leader that won't take responsibility for their actions. So you can pick that out in the tailboard critique. You can pick that out in training. Um, I had a call not even a call. It was a training thing. We were doing a uh, high risk, low frequency training drill off East Rock, which is about a 300 foot cliff. I wrote about it in the book and we had a rope system. We had people over the edge and I was there as a safety officer. And I looked at one, I think it was captain at the time. He came by and he looked at the rigging and then he kind of skirted away. And it just kind of, you just got to pay attention. And I said, wait, so I immediately went and looked at the rigging. I stopped the evolution. And Jason Rivera, who teaches at FDIC, I go, Jason, come here for a second. I go, this don't look right. Is the Prussix on the wrong side? And he, Jason goes, yeah. I go, all right, tie them off. We fixed it. I knew he saw it. I reported it up the chain of command. They didn't do anything about it. But the fact of the matter is I knew they saw it, but they were just so uncomfortable with themselves they were they didn't want to be embarrassed and they didn't want to say hey hold on a second here i don't know you got to be willing to admit if you don't know something right. if you're a boss you don't have to always have the answer to the question but you got to be able to ask the right questions and here's yeah. the thing. lawyers destroyed this for leadership across the country okay now first off there's no profession that's wrong more than the legal profession go in any courtroom the lawyer, one lawyer's right and one lawyer's wrong, right? So they're they're right and wrong 50% of the time. But what lawyers tell you, and the leadership people took this to heart, they say, don't ask a question unless you know the answer to it. For a lawyer, absolutely. But that's because the lawyer has the benefit of depositions before right. the trial. They've already asked that person the very same question, and now they're going to ask him again in the trial. So they say, if you didn't ask in deposition, don't ask it in the trial because now the person can go off. The problem is, is that normal leaders, business leaders, command officers took that advice and was like, oh, I don't ask a question unless I know the answer to it. I hear so many people say that. I go, because you're a fool. <laughs> what do you call it? If you don't have the right answer, you have to ask the questions. You don't have the benefit of depositions. You have to cover your blind spots. And the only way you're going to cover your blind spots is by asking questions and empowering people around you. So it's okay to ask a question you don't know the answer to. It's not going to diminish your command presence. It's going to allow you to build your other subordinates so that they're going to cover your blind spots. Fantastic. I think it's, uh, it's okay to be willing to, not be willing, it's necessary to understand that you're not always going to be the smartest person in a room. And you're lucky many times if you're not the smartest person in the room, because that means you're surrounded by people that, that you can learn from and, and grow a more successful team from. I've learned this way more being a coach than being a firefighter. Cause for me, it's like, you know, I, I firmly believe the best ideas have to win. And many times the best ideas may not be mine, but also being a coach, you learn to put your aces in their places. 
who is the right person for this position and then you have to trust them you know and uh i implement that in my life a lot you know i don't want to micromanage i want to put people in positions that seems to make sense overall for the team for the end goal what we're trying to accomplish and that's the key what are we trying to accomplish we need to identify that and then let's go out and get it done and trust your people which leads me to an article you wrote with a, a great friend of both of ours pj norwood but diminishing your own command three leadership fails uh i read this when it came out i reread it when i knew you were coming on because i thought this is something we need to uh touch on and talk about because again many people don't realize that their actions are not the ones uh of a leader or maybe like you said they're not remaining calm in a moment when they need to be the ones that are remaining calm because their strength in that person that maintains their posture and has calmness uh you know in the middle of a storm when everybody else is panicking i like to say it this way imagine if you're inside a building and you think you have absolute control of this fire right now but you hear the person on the outside the incident commander screaming on the radio all of a sudden you're thinking wait what's going on out there that i don't know about and now you're now that the anxiety's come in of wait there, this is something else is i thought we were knocking this down but something else is happening and that's in real life too but when we talk about this topic of diminishing your own command the first step you list is failure to delegate talk a little bit about that well let's make this a little broader because i want to make sure there's like a tactic tangible thing that they could take away from this is that okay. One of the problems that we have with fire officers is that as they get promoted, they still want to do the cool stuff that they used to do and not do the responsibilities of the job they have. So failure to delegate, I'll give, give you an example. Um, we were specking a new rescue truck, um, brand new, beautiful Seagrave rescue truck. And I had the chief of operations talking to me and telling me where he wanted to put the tools. And I'm like, are you going to use the tools? He's like, no. I'm like, so why do you care where they are? That's where you get the buy-in. So think about when you were a firefighter and the chief was trying to put the tools somewhere or make some decision that didn't affect the vision, didn't affect the budget, didn't affect the operations, but was something that you kind of had a little control over and you were around the table saying, this chief doesn't get it. And now all of a sudden you become a chief and it's like that child abuse uh, cycle you do the same exact thing. Now you think, oh, well, I'm the chief. I have all the right answers. No, you had the right answer when you were a firefighter. So if it doesn't affect the budget, doesn't affect operations, doesn't affect the SOPs, delegate and ask them where they want the tools and ask them to justify it and let them decide how to set up the truck. You're not going to be at a task level. You're going to be telling them tactics or strategies. They're going to have to perform at a task level give them some ownership of their position that's what i that's what pj and i mean about um failure to delegate and i want to give you one more tip i got from working in a think tank which i think that everybody can do and will help prevent people from micromanaging it's one of the greatest things ever so um my boss was going on a national interview and my boss is a visionary brilliant uh harvard princeton editor of the Harvard Law Review. I mean, we're talking about a brilliant individual, but she's not an executor, okay? She's visionary. So I'm like, hey, I'm going to text the boss, remind her about the interview. And he goes, oh, that's a bad move. And I go, go what do you mean? I go, I, I, I care. I want to make sure she, you know, she gets it. He goes, he goes, think about this. He goes, he goes, you're micromanaging up and this could go both ways. He goes, instead of texting her a reminder about this interview, you could take this with a project or anything, text her and say, I'm looking forward to seeing you on this interview today at two o'clock with so-and-so. I got a nice text back. Oh, thanks. I'm so glad that you're gonna, gonna be watching. So same thing for the chief. If somebody's got a project that you're worried whether they're going to get done, you could say, hey, are you going to get that project done by Tuesday and micromanage them? Or you could say, hey, I'm really looking forward to your presentation on Tuesday. I'm going to be there or I'm going to be checking in or asking, whatever. 
now you're empowering the person instead of minimizing them. And I, I actually took the quote and I put it right in the command presence book. I go, that's just brilliant advice that anybody could use in any situation when they want to make sure something gets done, but they're just saying it differently. I love it. Absolutely love it. Another one you you guys wrote about was failure to trust your people. That's a big one for me, man. You have to trust you. And, and, and this is uh, in line with everything we've already talked about. Uh, but you have to trust the people to, to get the job done. It's so important. Talk a little bit about trust. Well, trust comes down to training, right? So if you train your personnel and they know your expectations, and if you're the leader, they not only have to know your expectations, but they also have to believe in your vision for where the organization is going. And your vision has to align with the mission statement and values of that organization. We're only one person. Well, why do we all teach? You're only going to make so many grabs in your whole career. What? One, two, maybe, right? It's like a police officer, how many times they fire a gun. We train so we could have a little part of that when someone else does something great, right, for the community. So we're basically multiplying our effect by trusting our personnel. And Chris Sunwall, a battalion chief in Wallingford, Connecticut, taught me this, and I, I think it's great. If we're mentoring somebody, we want to, you know, put our trust in them and kind of build up that person. If it's somebody that's not on your shift, then of course, mentor the star. You're trying to get somebody at FDIC to teach at that level. You want to look down and say, hey, look, here's somebody that just needs a little more polish and they could get to the next level. You want to mentor the star. Leaders on shifts and in their own department tend to take that same advice, that's a trap. That diminishes their command. The person that's the star, the person who checks the truck, the person that you know is going to be a great officer, they need you to put some trust in them. You still need to oversee them, but you need to step back a little and let that person grow, let them make a few mistakes, give them some guidance. But where the real mentoring comes in is if you're working there at your volunteer department or pay department, you want to pick somebody that in the margins somebody that's just outside, not the shiny star, and find out what motivates them and bring them into the fold. That's where the leadership challenge is, not always building up that star. And I thought that was great advice. And I always took that to heart at work and always tried to evaluate people by one standard, regardless of your politics, regardless of, of this or that. If you would make your wife a widow or your husband a widow and your kids parentless to save me when I do something stupid, I can get past any petty thing at all. And we see so much mutual jealousy in fire departments. We always, you know, here's this uh, woman that's phenomenal. And here's this guy that's phenomenal. They got an issue. It's like mutual jealousy or you get, get two shifts that are really good. We want that competitiveness. We want that banter, but we want to realize that, hey, these are the people we count on. Let's build up the others and get them to that level. Mm. A couple of nights ago, pitcher on the Yankees pitches a perfect game. Great accomplishment. A couple of things about that accomplishment. In the two games before, he pitched a total of four and a half innings. Gave up 15 runs in four and a half innings. Comes out, pitches a perfect game. But when you pitch a perfect game, you have a whole team supporting you. You have a catcher that's calling every pitch. You have a, a defense that's making every play to make sure nobody gets on base. It is about the team. It is not about just the pitcher. The pitcher did the hardest part of that deal, for sure. But the pressure everybody else felt in the eighth and ninth inning, even the catcher afterwards says, I took an extra second before calling every pitch in that last inning thinking, I don't want to blow up by calling the wrong pitch. It's about the team, you know, and, and a lot of what you just said there kind of revolves around that. And I love it. Uh, I the last, the third. I haven't yeah. watched baseball, Frank, in a long time, but isn't it, wasn't it the Yankees that don't put the names on the back of the shirts? Cause everybody's on the same team. That is correct. That's a, That's an important le lesson. Cause you're only as good as your team. Yeah, man. You know, you know, and I'd like to, to say it this way for firefighters, because we do put in many departments, we put our names on the back of our jackets important and, for rit important for rit so don't well, well no 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 but but what i mean is we put the names on back of our jacket and we have our department 
on, on our helmet. And what I like to say to firefighters is this, make both names proud. Make both names proud, you know, because that one represents your family and the other one represents the organization and community that you serve. And, um, you know, you spoke one time before I get to the third uh, that you listen to the article. I heard you tell this story and I don't even know if you'll remember it. Maybe you'll remember it immediately. But you, like me, you go out and you do a lot some teaching in organizations. Um, and you said one time you went in and you, here you are, you're the guest instructor. Same thing, right? We go in and we teach about leadership, team development. And you had gone to, I don't know if it was in third department or at an event, dressed up and everything, and everybody kind of ignored you, or didn't treat you, hey, they didn't treat you like, hey, welcome into our family, it's nice to meet you, and what can we get, you know, can I get you something? It was almost like you're you're there to talk to them about leadership and customer service and command presence, and they're ignoring the fact that you and somebody else was, I remember you saying there were two of you, you're right there and are not paying attention to you. Not that you or I are a big deal. Some people should not ignore us. That's not the point. The point is that you were a stranger walking into a community and were there to talk to them about leadership, team development, and customer service. And are not paying attention to the fact that they have someone right now that they can practice their skills on and say, hey, how are you? My name's so-and-so. It's nice to meet you. Do you remember that story? I absolutely remember it because it was an I Chiefs uh, like regional convention. And what it was, was I was their keynote speaker, or keynote presentation for the next morning. And I was invited to meet all these chiefs in a, essentially a hotel party. But I only had one name of who I was supposed to ask for. So I knock on the door and I'm I usually always dress up. So the, one of the chiefs answers the door. And so I say, hello, I'm Frank. Is so-and-so here? And they said, no, um, I think he left. Um, have a good night and shut the door. So they, and I was like, okay. So, so, so the next morning I brought it up in class is that here I was invited to an event, but be, if I was wearing a fire department shirt, I think I probably would have been invited in. So I got to give them a little bit of a thing. Yeah. But they were just like, oh, it's some stranger there. And who the individual, the chief who answered the door never introduced himself never said, hey, good to see you. How can I help you? Never asked any questions, just simply was like, oh, no, he's not here. I was like, okay, send the stranger on their way. So the, the lesson in that is always introduce yourself. Um, I talk about it in the book. It's, it's a great story. I'm teaching at FDIC, a leadership class, and an unassuming guy walks in and says, hey, Frank, can I get you a cup of coffee? And I said, absolutely not. You never know. I'll get you a cup of coffee. And it was Kevin Shea. So I bring Kevin up in front of the class and I say, uh, everybody here, did you introduce yourself to the person sitting next to you? And only two hands of the whole class went up. I said, you never know who you're talking to. I go, who wants their picture taken with Kevin Shea? He's the most famous New York City firefighter ever. So I stopped the whole class and everybody got a picture with Kevin Shea and it was like a great event. So always introduce yourself and always be the one as a leader to cross that, what I call the awkward divide. And don't ever say nice to meet you. Get that out of your thing because Frank, you know, you teach all around the country, the world. I hold you in very high esteem. But if somebody takes your class, and has a fleeting moment with you where they walk up to talk to Frank Bacuso, who they read your books, they listen to Flashpoint podcasts, they go up and they're like, hey, Frank, I got your book. Can you sign this or whatever, whatever they say? Here's a patch from my department. And you say, hey, great, thanks. Well, to them, they know you now. That was just a fleeting interaction. You won't remember that person a month from now. But now you're at FDIC two years later, that person comes up to you with their friend who they just been saying, I met Frank Baguso. Yeah. He was so down to earth. He took time to talk to me. And you go up to that person and say, hey, nice to meet you. Now you just diminish that person's command presence in front of their friend that they valued Frank Baguso so much. They were telling their friend, hey, you got to meet Frank. He's a great guy. And now you just embarrass them. So you'll notice that good politicians always when they go up and shake somebody's hand, good to see you. Yeah. Yep. Never get yourself jammed up that way because we forget who we meet. The higher you get, 
Um, yeah, well, you know what? That, that is so, I mean, I started doing that many years ago, saying it's good to see you when I shake somebody's hand because I'm, for that exact reason. And FDIC is a perfect example. You meet hundreds and hundreds of people there. You know, I have an interesting story. I, I'm, I'm almost hesitant to, te- to tell it because I don't want... Um, I don't want this to sound like it's about me, but I but I think it's important to tell it because people about can you. learn from. We're gonna well, have a Taylor Swift moment. What's that? We're gonna have a Taylor Swift moment. I don't even know what a Taylor Swift moment is, but uh, <laughs> no, um, I, I find it's so funny you bring up Taylor Swift. I, my two boys, I'm walking out of the. Um, she's on tour uh, the, this last week, and everybody's all the ladies and their daughters are trying to get tickets. And as a joke, I'm walking out the mall yesterday. We just got video games for my boys uh, and some baseball stuff. I walk out and I go, hey, you guys want me to see if I can get you some Taylor Swift tickets? And they go, oh, no. I'm like, all right, I'm just checking. I didn't know if this was a nationwide epidemic or just uh, among the ladies. But um, so we're at FDIC and there's a gentleman. Uh, he's in a wheelchair and he's trying to get out of the wheelchair to go into the restroom and i'm assuming he's there with his daughter or and or wife because there were two ladies there and they were there and i walk into the bathroom and i stop and i look back and i and i said can i help you and i said to them i'll help him and so i i, I helped the man in uh, he could walk he just had the wheelchair to help get him around i help him in he goes to the bathroom and I legitimately, you know, helped him throughout the process, meaning just stood near him, made sure he didn't fall or anything, gave him uh, towels after he washed his hands, walked him back out, put him in a chair, and I left. And I got back home and I had two emails from firefighters that saw that, that sent me a message saying, hey, I just saw what you did at this moment. And and thought, man, you're, you're the real deal. You don't just say these things like you you really go out of your way to help people because it was in an area where there wasn't many people. And I and I told my wife, I said, you know, this this an interesting thing that happened is just being aware of people, being aware of people like who need your help right now. I mean, this is what we do. We're in pu- we're public servants. And if you ever walk by somebody in need, I think you're 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 taking the essence of of what a, being a firefighter is all about. You're taking it away. Like we're here to help people in times of need. And it's not just because an alarm goes off and hey, I'm on duty. For me, it's all the time. It's the way that I look at it. And, you know, I wanted to touch on that because something that you just said a moment ago triggered the thought that, you know, how, how people are, they're paying attention. They're paying attention to your leadership. You mentioned a while ago in this conversation about social media. I see people that, there's two things I see on social media, people building an entire brand on social media, but not living it for real. That's one. And the other thing I see is people diminishing their leadership credibility on social media by the stuff they post, by calling people names and, and throwing out curses or, or throwing out really distasteful stuff on Facebook that I'm thinking, how do you not realize that's not what we want them people to think about when you think about it. these are working firefighters but we want them to think about firefighters in this way whether or not you agree or disagree with the things that, well of course you agree with the things you post but whether or not you agree with it there's a right place and a right way to express yourself and i see people doing it wrong do you do you see that also you see social Absolutely. media people i mean generally when people result to insult it's to obscure their weakness of their position yes Um, there is a distinction between satire and humor um satire and humor can be an effective way to convey a message but that's different from just being mean and insulting somebody which is means that your position cannot survive a cogent debate and you're actually putting forth a position of weakness i always say that your social media presence should be your personality with one beer not three or four Um, so, and the funny thing is, is that, and maybe I set the wrong example sometimes because I've had to correct some of my friends because I am a very, I'm not a partisan individual, but I'm a political individual and I work in a political realm, not a partisan realm. So 
what I'm tweeting is different than what like a firefighter should be tweeting all the time. I do the fire department stuff too. And I will call a lot of my friends and be like, you're there saying you're chief of a department. You're representing your department. You can't get away with saying the same stuff that I say. Maybe you don't want to retweet that, or maybe you want to kind of stay away from that because while everybody has a first amendment, right? There's a actual balancing act. If you're there in a fire department shirt and uniform, that balancing, the Pickering test sometimes can go in favor of against your First Amendment right to speech. So you got to be real careful, especially if you're posting on social media with your department uniform shirt on, your helmet, um, saying what department you work for. So I think people definitely need to, I always say, don't, don't do anything that makes you feel good when you're angry, you know. If, if you're currently working on a job in the environment that we're in right now, you're a volunteer or paid firefighter, don't just hit that, that send button, you know, make sure you think about what you send because you can't take it down. I'm in a position in my life right now where it don't matter what I post. Other people, there are severe consequences that could affect their livelihood, their reputation and everything else. So be very cautious of what you post. And, you know, one quick meme could be taken completely the wrong way. So be be cautious of what you post. Be cautious because you, you, yes, you have the right to free speech, but your employer has a right to determine whether or not they feel you could effectively serve that community. Absolutely. And everything counts. Now, number three was failure to listen. And again, we're talking about diminishing your own command presence, failure to listen. I think it is the most underutilized skill in the world when it comes to leadership is the inability to listen with the intent of understanding what the person or people are saying. Because I, I believe everything you just said, know who you are, know what you want, learn to how learn how to articulate it, stay calm and in control, but also Listen, listen, can you talk a little bit about the power of listening? Okay, so the fire department has an issue of this because our command presence is often viewed on how we act on an emergency scene where you're giving direct, clear, concise message. But the real power in the firehouse and administratively is listening. A great chess master said, when you see a good move, look for a better move. And Command presence actually shifts from an emergency scene to an administrative scene. I'll take it back to negotiations. And I learned this being a union president is that if you're negotiating something, you're only closing the deal that 1% of the time, that 99% of the time you're garnering information. So in the administrative world, you're garnering information. And in those types of situations, especially at a negotiating table or the kitchen table, the more you talk, the less command presence you have. You're actually speaking from a position of weakness. The more you listen and ask questions, the more information you're going to have, the more effective you're going to be at putting your vision forward. Fantastic. Frank, I, got a, I, hey, I, got a, I got an exercise. You, everybody listening can do, and it, it's, it's funny. So you want to increase your command presence. You want to listen more. The next call you have with somebody, could be your mom, could be, could be anybody. Try to see how long you can go through that conversation on the phone without making a statement, only asking questions about what the person says. Occasionally at some point in, you're going to have to make a statement just as a bridge, but you're going to try to minimize that as much as possible. And you're going to see, you could go 20 or 30 minutes just asking questions. And the other person, when you hang up, is going to think they had the best conversation with you. It's That's a- fantastic. You know, uh, one of the very first books I read about uh, just leadership communication was How to Win Friends and Influence People. And he he said something pretty similar. He said uh, that there were people that felt he was a great conversationalist. And in the conversation, he never talked at all about himself. He kept asking them more questions about them. And he said, and the, and the, the thing that uh, there's the most, I can't remember the, his wording, but like the greatest sound a person could ever hear is the sound of their name being said back to them. And I always took that to heart and thought, you know what? Um, Although like you, you know, I I will stand in front of a room sometimes for two, three, five, sometimes six hours 
and present the class. And we're in a position right now where we're doing more talking than listening. When it comes to, to being a conversationalist, I love reversing that and doing way more listening than I do speaking. And it took a while to get there. When I was younger, I think I was, I talked a lot because I was actually insecure. And, and I don't know if that would make sense, but maybe it'll make sense to some listeners. I talked a lot because I was insecure and I wanted to sound like, oh, no, no, he's not, he's, he's not an idiot. He has an opinion. Uh, let me hear what he has to say. When in reality, they were probably saying, I wish this kid would just shut up and listen. But I just wasn't mature enough to, to process all of that. So the, uh, I guess the, what I'll end is this, shut up and listen, and you will be surprised by how much more credibility you can earn from the people around you because they're valuing the fact that you are listening to them. But there's a ahead. tactic, a strategy and tactics thing you can use to be better conversationalist, okay? Not everybody's a natural people person. You're going to find that if you ever go through reality training to be a realtor, they train people in the Ford method. And I'm going to hope I don't, I don't get them out of order here. So when you're talking to somebody, the safe subjects that you can always talk to them about is ask them about their family, ask them about their uh, occupation, occupation, ask about recreation, what they're going to be doing on their family trip, and then ask them about their dreams. So if you use the Ford method, if you're not somebody who's naturally, you know, if, if that's your blind spot, hey, I don't like making small talk. Well, use the Ford method. It doesn't got to be in that order, but you can really get a conversation going where that person's going to feel that you really are listening to them. You know, it was, they're going to be surprised coming from me, but who was great at this was Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton had command presence and Bill Clinton, if you were in the room with him, you thought you were the only one in the room with you with him because he was always asking questions about you, not talking about him. He had probably the best retail politics of, of anybody. So you, whether you're a conservative or a, a liberal, you can learn from, from both sides. And uh, if, if I can make, because um, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here, you said, if I yeah. can bring up one thing about Jimmy Carter, because it's such a leadership trend now, can I have a little leeway here? Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. So there's this big trend for servant leadership. I see people putting it on there. I'm a servant leader. Okay. Listen, there's, I think like 59 and probably still growing leadership theories out there. You want to take a little bit of the good from every single one. And you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket because you're going to sell yourself short. Jimmy Carter was probably our best past president, former president. He accomplished more as former president than any other president in our history. Consummate professional. He was a servant leader. However, he used that same exact model when he was president. And, and it didn't now work with the Biden out. administration, he probably is going to go down as the second worst president we've had. So it didn't work in both things. He carried his bags into the White House. So yeah. I got this question from a fire officer. I'm going to bring it to a fire officer thing. So we went back to flashpoint. Said, hey, uh, you know, I can't get the guys on my shift and girls on my shift to wash the truck. I go, okay, so there's a couple of things you can do. You can get on the PA and say, wash the truck because I'm the boss. That, you're, that's a trap. You're going to fail. I said, what I used to do is if I needed something like that done, I would go grab the hose and start washing the truck. And he's like, oh. And I go, but here's the trap. You got to start washing the truck, but you can't finish washing the truck if you're the boss. You have more important things to do. So you start washing the truck or you start sweeping the floor. Everybody's going to come start sweeping the floor or washing the truck because you're doing it as the boss. Don't finish it. Do it for a little bit, conversate with them, and then leave. Don't diminish your own command by staying there the whole entire time. That goes for raking leaves. That goes for uh, cutting the lawn. If you're trying to get people to do something without ordering them to do it, you want them to follow your example, but don't diminish your own command by staying there too long. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, most people will say Ronald Reagan had command presence and was probably one of our best presidents because he mm -hmm. always projected a consistent set of standards and values, and he always surrounded himself with the pomp and circumstance of the position. So don't give away your command, but be that leader that's going to lead by example. Fantastic. Frank, thank you so much for coming on, talking to me about your new book. Uh, just talk about how people can get a hold of you and pick up a copy of Command Presence, Increase Your Influence. 
Command Presence, Increase Your Influence is available on Amazon. It's available at Barnes & Noble. It's available for directly from fireengineering.com. I just had a firefighter send me a promo code um, for a discount better than Frank Bacuso. I don't know if it works. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> somebody I hold in the highest esteem, I recommend you get in every one of Frank's books. Frank is a true leader. It's a true honor to be on this show today. I moved everything so I could be here today. Um, so I really appreciate it, but check out the book. I make you one promise. You probably won't learn anything from the book, but it will entertain you. And it's just a matter of time, if you're the boss, that you find yourself in front of a camera, in front of a judge, in front of a room of people that don't agree with you, or making a decision, an emergency decision at work or on the fire ground, this book will give you the tactics and behaviors to just make you a little bit better at your job. Because if you're going to order this book, the chances are you already have those characteristics of being trustworthy and all those great things we talk about going into leader. This book breaks down the tactics on how you could just make yourself a little bit better. Fantastic. Frank, thank you so much. Pick up a copy of Command Presence and hopefully we'll be able to have you on again soon. If not, I'll be in that backyard for some uh, some Frank Ritchie New Haven pizza sometime soon. <laughs>